including Everest. So a th- fairly full list of achievements, Vanessa. Morning. <laughs> Good morning, Simon. How are you? I'm, well, I'm very well, thank you. I'm, <laughs> I'm amazed you've got time to sit sit in a studio and chat to us because there's, there's, there's a whole world out there that you kind of seem to quite like exploring. Oh, that's OK. I'm just walking around the studio now. <laughs> yeah, you're always moving. So um, look, when, when did you start discovering this kind of challenge excited you and made you want to do this kind of thing? Well, I like I like that you're talking about um, you know asking your viewers today um, you know about their challenges mm. because that's really what it's all about um, you know taking one step forward and putting your focused uh, you know talent energies and seeing what you can do. I started in 2010, so I came really really late to mountaineering, but I absolutely love the challenge of it. Um, I so- love battling the weather, the extremes, and really seeing what I can do if I take one step further. So now what made you, though, think, well, actually, do you know what? I'm going to climb that. I'm going to, you know, it might be cold up there and I might slip, but I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a go. Well, you know, it, it's, it's funny, you know, I, I actually couldn't think of anything harder to do. Um, and that was partially because Everest, in, in 2010, I was thinking, well, you know, Everest had happened then, meaning 1953, 54, but it was happening now. It was happening in 2010. It was it was one of those things that were taking place now. Um, I didn't know much about mountaineering, but it was a skill I could learn. I didn't know if I'd be any good at it, and I didn't know if I'd like it, but it was a skill I could learn. But had you done anything sort of a bit sort of on the edge, a bit dangerous before? Well, I had technically climbed Kilimanjaro. So that's quite a big achievement already then. Yeah, you know, but, but the difference is, is that Kilimanjaro is done with, um, you know, hiking boots. So there's no alpine kit. Um, so the big difference is you have to learn, you know, what all this stuff is, right? Mm. What's, what's the helmet? What's the harness? What's the crampon? You know, what, what are these technical tools and how do they work? And so that's really what the, the difference was. Um, Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in Africa, um, but you can get there, um, you know, just with a pair of hiking boots. And a lot of people do sort of tours and that kind of thing, don't they? So it's 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 almost a bit more commercialised now, or or you know easier for people to kind of do it who perhaps haven't got a background, like you say, in mountaineering. But um, then I'm thinking Everest. That's a whole step up, isn't it? Yeah, I mean Everest. You know, you really do need to know alpine or high high altitude mountaineering. I think you know, for people who really are interested in in Everest, you know, you need to understand not only alpine mountaineering but you really need to understand how your body performs at high altitude and it is very different isn't it because of the pressure and all of that kind of stuff as well as the the starvation that you're going through absolutely because you enter the death zone at 8,000 meters so you want to understand what happens to your body as you go higher and and you know what that what effect that has on you um, so most people try a, a smaller 8,000 meter peak mm. um, before they attempt something like other Everest just to make sure you know, what does it feel like for me? Um, so that when they get there, they, they're not surprised by, oh, no, you know, I can't breathe. I, I'm going to probably ask the most stupid question you're going to have been asked all day. Um, the, the death zone, I'm assuming it's called the death zone because some people don't get through it. Yeah, I mean, the death zone is, uh, is, is you could draw an imaginary line at 8,000 meters or 26,000 feet. Um, and it's it, it gets that name primarily because that's where the body starts deteriorating. Um, it starts to die effectively. And you know what that means is that uh, co- cognitive impairment, the brain starts to kind of shut down from mm. the lack of oxygen. Um, there's some adrenal failure, so the kidneys are starting to shut down. Um, you know, wherever there's lack of oxygen, all of those internal organs are starting to, to fail. And when you put yourself up for something like this and you are getting your head in the right place to be able to achieve it, what do your friends and family say when you say, oh, by the way, next week, doing Everest? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, naturally, uh, friends and family are, are, are worried and, you know, terrified. But, you know, your, your supporters or cheerleaders are out there saying, OK, you've trained hard for this. Um, you know, you have a good, a good team around you. Um, you know, we know that you know when to turn back. Um, you know, by now, of course, history is littered with, you know, those famous stories, you know, into thin air. And, you know, they've been made into books and films about all sorts of tragedies. And so, of course, you hope not to repeat those and to have learned from the past. 
And K2, I mean, let's let's not underestimate how enormous this is. Not just physically enormous, but it's it's known as the Savage Mountain. Um, and uh, the statistic that I read, which it would frighten me to death, is that a quarter of the mountaineers who who summit die trying to make their way down. So you kind of even if you get up there, you're still not over the worst. Yeah, that's right. So for every four that climb, one dies. Uh, so it does make that uh, incredibly challenging. Um, K2 is the second highest mountain in the world, so it's just 237 meters lower than than Everest. Uh, it's in Pakistan rather than Nepal. Um, there have been, uh, let's say, only 20 women that have stood on the very, very top of uh, K2, whereas there's 489 women who have stood on the summit of, of Everest. So, you know, huge, huge differences in terms of um, statistics. And many of us will never do anything like this in our lives. So just just sort of talk us through the moment that you are there at the top. I'm assuming you're, you're knackered, you're starving, <laughs> you're cold. You, but how do you feel? Yeah, you know, it's, it's only in Hollywood films that you see that, you know, kind of jump for joy and, you know, the high fives and all of that. The reality is, you know, after 16 hours of battling, you know, gale force winds and sinking into deep snow and you know, when you finally arrive that you're exactly right, you're, you're knackered and you realize that you're only halfway and it's like, shit, halfway, right? I mean, you got to get down. And 85% of deaths happen on the way down. So that, you know, sinking realization of, you know, it's taking you this long to get there and you have to get down is, is that, um, you know, that sort of, you know, disbelief that although it's beautiful and you, t- you do pause to take in the views that you really, you know, you've got to like, snap it snap together and you know rally to to get you know take those pictures and get down as fast as you can and and one of the things that i read about you which is so lovely is that on the way up whatever you're going through whatever you're you're hoping to achieve you you were able to remember the dozens of climbers who didn't do as well as you and you were you were helping to to make sure the memorials were still all in place yeah i mean for me you know i i've I'm very touched by every single life that has been lost, um, you know, especially on K2, because it took me three years. I spent almost six life or six months on this mountain, you know, collectively over those um, three years. And, you know, the second year I was there, I, I went actually with uh, Di Gilbert, who's a um, Scottish climber. And she and I went and took inventory um, of all of the uh, plaques, memorial plaques, and there should have been 84 and we found 20 missing. So um, I went to Rawapindi, which is uh, one of the uh, s- uh, smaller, well, it's not small anymore, <laughs> one of the large uh, towns, um, and found the old tin plates. And we had those engraved for 20, it was 20 different nation, uh, 20 nationalities dating back 37 years. Um, and I thought, okay, well, I may not be the one to take it back, but maybe I can find a K2 winter ascent. But nobody went back. So I thought, okay, well, we'll have to find somebody to take these plaques back. And as it turned out, I was the next person to take it back because I was the next expedition. So we hung those this year. I had a kitchen crew who happened, you know, have a, a subsidiary in, um, you know, carpentry, thank God. And uh, we just went and hung them and almost created another memorial in the process. Oh, amazing stuff. Um, th- there's one last question I have to ask of you, and that's, that's you've done so much. What's next? Gosh, you know, there's so many things left to do. And, um, you know, for me, partially mountaineering is a metaphor. So, you know, um, I always like to encourage viewers, you know, it's not mountaineering necessarily that, that I like to encourage, but I like to encourage anybody who's doing anything you know, to always persevere and to make sure that they continue to, you know, you know, like it took me three years and if I'd given up, I would never have achieved this. So always, always go after the goal that you have your eyes focused on. But, uh, you know, what's next? There could be all sorts of things that are interesting. I find the Marianas Trench interesting because it's deeper than Everest is tall. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, but there's all sorts of, you know, things around the world that that need um, attention and focus around scientific um, exploration and giving back uh, glaciers uh, that are receding around the world um, and projects around, um, you know, um, climate change. So Mm. that that could be a, a worthwhile focus. Well, whatever it is, come back and tell us about it after you've done it. It's I will. It's been very lovely chat, chat, chatting and catching up with you this morning. That's Vanessa O'Brien. Thank you, Vanessa. Lovely. Thank you, Simon.